Hi everyone, thank you for being here. I realize other options were available um, and I see a number of you chose this one, so that's the ones I can see with the lights. Um, my name is Sarah Jane Madden. I am the Chief Information Security Officer for the Sensing Technology Group at Fortive. I had somebody come up to me this morning who knows Fortive and went, oh, you're the CISO for Fortive. No, for the record, I'm not. That's uh, my colleague Richard Noonan. I have come from a background of, I started as a tester, I was what we used to call a sysadmin and then a developer for a couple of decades, not to date myself. We, in, in what we do, I work for, um, I serve a group of companies that work on technology that we take for granted every day. It's all around you, we're ubiquitous, we, we're in renewable energy and we're in oil and gas. How did you get here today? We're in transportation, we're in healthcare, we are in um, medical devices, we are in uh, kind of hardware, all those areas. That means that no matter who is flavor of the month in terms of attacks and threats, we're there somewhere and um, we're always in it. So we are all around you, but not in a weird way, I promise. Kind of. Um, I'm also an application security champion. Now, what does that mean? Do I have a, a, a cupboard full of trophies at home for this? No, I don't. It's just a really kind way of saying I've been evangelizing um, good security practices, AppSec before it was AppSec amongst our developers, and it said it's a kind way of saying, boy, doesn't she go on about it. So that's why we have an application security champion. Now, um, as the speakers said earlier, uh, Adam did some wonderful training, Adam Shostak did wonderful training on the hows of threat modeling. I'm not going to do that today. I have nothing to sell you except war stories, to be honest with you. I have no tools to show you. So if you came here saying, I skipped the training, but I'm going to learn how to do threat modeling, not here. This is, this is more about how, literally how we got this going with uh, mature teams. So we're all looking at our hands and if you want to exit, that's okay. I won't take offense. Okay. But I won't be going through the hows of, of, of threat modeling and kudos to anybody who gets the reference of, uh, cat lawyer. So nobody snuck out the back. That's a, that's impressive. This is a little bit of a sidebar, but that I want you to take the whole way through today's presentation. And honestly, if it's the only thing you take and ponder, it will stand you in good stead going forward. Software engineering and cybersecurity are obviously deeply technical practices, but it's to oversimplify to say that they're just that. There's a huge element of creativity in software engineering, and that's why I always say it's science meets art, right? You'll rarely find a, a rock star developer who is just pure techie. Nobody really gives you, or my experience anyway, the perfect specs for what you're about to build. There's a lot of creativity weaves in there, and you just know the technology to be able to implement that. Similarly, cyber is obviously a very technical area, but it's about hearts and minds as much as it is about tools and methods and TTVs and that type of thing. The fact of the matter is you have to get people on board. There's a lot of negotiation involved in cybersecurity, or at least in a, in a successful cybersecurity program. So, right, let's just get on with the threat modeling. Why can't we just do threat modeling? We've learned about it. It sounds great. Come on, let's just get on with it. You know, I feel you, right? I was in a software company within Fortive um, where I was responsible for building out and rolling out, and that's very important, not, ju not just kind of coming up with the ideas, but actually rolling out a secure product development framework. The more I read, the more I listened, the more tutorials I went to, the more I fangirled the guys from the, the, the Threat Modeling Manifesto, and um, the more I thought that this held so much promise. This was going to solve all our problems. Slight asterisks. And um, why wouldn't we just shift everything so far left that we never had to worry again about a problem popping up just pre-production or even worse, post-production, about wrangling with priorities and arguing with people over which, you know, should the blue button on the screen go out or should we fix the SQL injection? And um, strange as it sounds, those conversations happen. And that's when kind of the reality is data flow diagrams or system diagrams 
they don't look like this. Not for real systems, okay? So this is what you're seeing in all the material that I was consuming. I'm very much a consumer of what those spoke this morning um, created. If a system does anything meaningful at all, and therefore makes any money, it's going to start to look a little bit more like this, okay? Those of you who've been studying threat modeling are probably going, hang on a second, I recognize that as well. That's also a demo diagram. And it is, okay? Two reasons I did not put one of our real threat models for our real systems that have been built over decades up there. One is, I was afraid of your eyesight, okay? And I want to be protective of it. I didn't want people getting dizzy and feeling nauseous. The other is, and this is another sidebar, but with my absolute cyber hat on, I'm going to warn you about sharing uh, your threat models, okay? It's great. We like to open source stuff. I don't believe in security through obscurity, okay? But you're using your data flow diagrams and your threat models to discover the weaknesses in your system. Who else would love that? The bad guys, bad gals, whichever. So by publishing them, sharing them, even something as innocuous as in a friendly conference environment, there could be something there, even if it's an old one, that you have not yet spotted, that somebody else does. So don't make it easy for your adversaries, okay? Don't share your threat model diagrams too, too lightly. This is where I'm going to start my first little story from the trenches. Um, and it's a story of failure, okay? Uh, but it's a more story about understanding the importance of impetus. When I first started to introduce threat modeling as more than just a passing thought, the problem with the phrase threat modeling is everybody thinks they understand what it is. And to a certain extent, you do. You, you, you did it from the moment you got up this morning. You're assessing risks and what could go wrong. You're doing it subconsciously. But I went to introduce it as a best practice. The problem with best practice is it, in a commercial or an enterprise environment, it's rarely a, no, a good enough reason, okay? Um, Thankfully, I was not doing this off the back of, you know, so many security measures get introduced post an event, post a, an adverse event. We weren't coming in from that. We were, we were sort of trying to do the right thing. And um, our story also started before the executive order 14028 came out in the US, which basically says you should do threat modeling. So we had none of those nice, handy, they say, you got to do it to, to point to. So I was coming very much from this, hey, it sounds like a good idea, um, almost an academic point of view. I, I had been convinced and I was, going to, I was going to share my enthusiasm with everybody. So I got up and running um, with, I was given some teams, some teams of developers, but they were smoothly running teams, um, in, in essence, mature teams who could absorb the interruption. Um, Senior engineering management gave me time with them, and that was great, and we got going. But essentially, it was an indulgence. They were doing me a favor. Um, it, well intended, but it, it wasn't where we were going to go. I quickly realized that what was happening was this was being viewed as a security training exercise. Give Sarah Jane a few hours with the, the teams that can handle it, and um, we'll tick some boxes. That great. That that would be great. I certainly wasn't expected to kind of produce something. Um, I wasn't expected to start creating JIRAs uh, and uh, pumping them in through people's backlogs. Uh, I was really expected to have these sessions and create a pretty PowerPoint at quarter end and we tick some boxes. That wasn't really what we were, were going for. And that's where I had failed. Okay, I'd failed on to understand why engineering leadership should really want this change. Okay, and um, why product management should even care. And whatever sense of that, I was so caught up in why this was the right thing to do that I hadn't stopped to think about that. And um, where I had thought about it, I kind of kept it to myself. I didn't communicate it. I'd just gone, hey, there's this threat modeling thing, we should do it. Back to the hearts and minds things. I had basically cashed in some heart chips with the engineering leadership, and I'd not appealed to their minds at all. And that was going to stunt my ability to get threat modeling going as, as a sustainable practice um, where we were. 
So those initial workshops were deemed a success. Okay. But really, you know, people were excited. Developers really enjoyed it. We used the elevation of privilege game. We used all those sample diagrams. People felt really cool about it, you know, and we were talking about mad stuff all together. Of course, they were able to manage the, 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 the sample diagrams, etc. But I had experienced a failure to launch a lot of noise and excitement and nothing really to boast about. And that's when I had to examine the why of the why. Okay. Why were we not making progress? Why was this not taking off? Why was it not gathering momentum? And the why of that is because I hadn't understood the why. Um, again, I was putting another practice in before you can get a piece of software out the door. So I decided I needed to show how this would really impact us. So I went nosing about in Jira. I am not the best. I kind of clunk around in Jira. And I said, I need to find a ticket. That wouldn't have happened if we, or potentially wouldn't have happened if we threat modeled. So even with my um, bull in a china shop roaming around Jira, what I found was a list. Okay, and this this surprised me because uh, you know I was uh, by no means a threat modeling guru, and we had products that didn't specifically have you know security wasn't a big problem, not not any more than any other. Um, product. So to be able to sort of I quickly identify a list surprised me. But in that, I saw an opportunity because I'm dealing with many teams who've come together to acquisition. So it's not just one development team. We have hundreds of developers. I was able to find a team who had a group of these tickets. And this is where I approached their product manager. Now, I had been through all the, the material that said, oh, you should have everybody from legal to sales to the person who makes coffee in the room. Everybody has some input. And that's great until you're in an environment that's, you know, commercialized. Everybody's time is precious. You know, developers' time is money. And um, so is product management, et cetera. So you do try and do it as lean as, as possible. So that's why I hadn't previously brought I'd gone for the soft spot. I'd gone for my pals in engineering. We spoke the same language, but I needed to broaden the horizons. And I went to the product manager of that particular product and I said, Hey, remember Jira number one, two, three, four, five, and this and this and this. And luckily for me, not so for him, he was still feeling the pain of those tickets, those interruptions, because of course it's all for him about moving things along, getting as many features in as possible. So he was prepared to engage quite readily. And now I had a product manager who not only controls the product roadmap, but by proxy controls the developer's time, talking to me about whether this should go into grooming or sprint planning, etc. Not things I thought about. And by the way, one size does not fit all. It completely depends on your culture where that would go. But when the conversation got to that level, it meant he was now seeing the why. And that's because I had started to understand the, the, the why of all this. So we should be like ready to go now. Okay. We'd sorted out the problems. We'd, we'd gone too much on the, the, the theory initially and workshops. Now had a product manager on board onwards and upwards. I'd learned all the mistakes, learned from all the mistakes. Failure shouldn't be an option again. And this is where we come to the story of uh, Goldilocks or getting your launch team right. Okay. So we now had some kind of hard evidence that threat modeling could be helpful. Hey, here's tickets who we can reasonably, that we can reasonably say wouldn't have happened if we threat modeled. We're dealing with a large organization. So standardization is, is key. Okay. It makes things run smoother. So we got buy-in from engineering and product and, you know, on the basis that we've learned our lessons, we're going to do it properly this time. We got a slot in an all hands and we said, hey, here's all the links to all the blogs. We're going to do threat modeling. We're going to, you know, we're going to kick this off and everybody's going to do it. So we have 300 plus developers all going off with, you know, this instruction to start threat modeling. The problem was we were really only one page ahead in the threat modeling manual of the developers. And we became a bottleneck. Lots of questions started to come back. Not that we had the answers anyway, but lots of questions started to come back and we just couldn't keep up with them. We were a very small security team. 
So developers started to do what developers do best, and they started to invent solutions. Okay, And what we started to see popping up was like a myriad of threat modeling standards and threat modeling processes and threat modeling standard work um, appearing on intranet sites. The next thing we're being invited to lunch and learns from one given team on how to do threat modeling. Um, and then a week later, there'd be another one from a different team on how to do threat modeling properly. And this was going on. And basically, we had chaos, and it wasn't producing very much. What also happened was a number of the developers got um, very invested in what they were doing, and in this, what they were producing was a lot of documentation and presentations rather than tickets and mitigations. And it all got a little bit war of the buttons, you know, all very territorial, you know. I, I've, I got that intranet page published first, so you've got to do it my way and scrap what you just put your work in. So clearly, um, this wasn't working either. And, and the main point being that we actually weren't, we weren't getting um, any output. So it was kind of another slice of humble pie got served up to Sarah Jane hot and fresh. Okay, we had to, uh, we had a community of practice had to go out there and say, stop, basically stop, 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 All right? Lots of time and cycles were being burnt on this and nothing being produced. So the, the best way of saying stop is no more sprint time is being authorized to be spent on this. That's a, that's a fairly quick way of, of, of stopping it when you're in a data-driven organization and all the time is accounted for. So I had to go back and you know, this is where it's Goldilocks. First big chair, didn't suit, okay, didn't work at all. We just created chaos. Along the way, we had discovered a team who we had, who had come to us through acquisition, had been doing threat modeling all along, just by a different name, all right? So this seemed like, they were also a very mature team, a very measured team. This seemed like, you know, a cheat for me. We're going to, we now had agreement to work with them. I was going to observe, see some little tweaks that might need to be made, basically rebrand what they were going to do, and then just point at them and go, hey, everybody do what they did, okay? Because they had years of it behind them. So I sat in, uh, ready to copy their homework. And it took me a while, but I realized that this was not going to be usable. I was not trying to reinvent how to do threat modeling. I was trying to work out how to do threat modeling for teams who'd been developing software and were in their flow for years and years and years and years and years. The thing with this team, this, this team with the halo over their heads at the, at the moment was they had actually started doing this back when they were greenfield development. They couldn't even remember how they'd gotten there, gotten to where they were. They couldn't, you know, many of the people weren't even there. So in some ways, they aligned better with the academic examples. So they weren't really um, reusable. Did we steal some documents and things like that and how they store their, their models? Yes, they did. But I kind of came away going, that doesn't fit. That's, that's the exact problem we're trying to solve. They're, they're an example of doing it from, from the start. So if you know the story of Goldilocks, and I'm assuming most of you do, you kind of go, well, that didn't work either. So there must have been another option. And there was. There was, a, there was a group in the middle that were really the least attractive group. And, and I don't mean that in any personal remark about them. But they were like busy, busy teams that were working on software that was very much in demand was quite a number of years old, had a large active customer base that was, you know, looking for, for, um, you know, great, there was a great ideas funnels, there was features going out the whole time. They weren't as stable um, and as measured as the, the perfect team in the middle that we'd tried to copy. They couldn't really handle interruption well. And they were basically moving too fast, they were too busy. But that turned out to be perfect because they had no, they were so far removed from research mode, et cetera, they hadn't got the time to go off making a cottage industry out of this, okay? They wanted, everything they did had a purpose, um, got done, and went out the door. So when they were asked to look at threat modeling, they, did a, they took that exact same approach to it. They only had a certain amount of time to give to it, they weren't inclined to wander off the path, and they had to produce something out of it. 
we had good success with them. We started seeing reasonable tickets coming out. We started seeing fixes going in. We'd now proven that this kind of in the area that we were afraid to touch could work. So this was now, it was reasonable to say this was transferable to teams that were like either working on new innovations or on quieter projects or on products that were being we're still active, but being wound down because kind of the ones with the hardest remit had, had already managed this. Still though, um, threat modeling doesn't come easy, okay? I, I think if anybody was stopped outside and asked what was threat modeling, you'd give some shot at an answer, okay? And we all, as I said, we, we, you've been doing it since you got up this morning. We, we, we think about, you know, what are we trying to do? What could go wrong, et cetera. The problem when you try to bring this to teams um, with established, you know, large systems, large complex systems, is they go, I've read the manual. I've read the manifesto. I've watched the tutorial. I've listened to you. I sit down at my desk. And I don't know what, to, I don't know how to apply this. Okay. So there was an element of, you know, our developers know the technology best. Okay. Despite our backgrounds as a security team, we're coming in to kind of to champion and encourage. So we found that facilitated sessions were really the best thing to do where we would just kind of keep people on track. But the first thing we did, was we actually let them sit down and talk about macro events and the wild stuff of movies to get them excited and invested in, in the whole process. But then at some point you have to go come back, come back, come back, come back here a second, you know, come back and focus on your circle of control. I'm generalizing, but most software developers know more about technology than they do about the inner workings of crime gangs and uh, the dark net and international government relations. You can layer all that on later you are, uh, to, to when you have a list of threats and go, which is more likely to, to, you know, are we really in the crosshairs of kind of an anonymous attack or something like that? You can layer all that on. But it's about bringing back into, you know, what's going to make a difference? What can you control? And that, that's, that's the technical side of it. But it's no harm to let people explore the wider um, kind of, I suppose, horizon of all this. And this is where um, we, we also kind of, we put some guardrails in that helped. We said things like um, create diagrams, create diagrams before the sessions. Now that's what worked for us, okay? We actually had teams within that where creating the diagrams during the sessions were better. And that was fine. We weren't looking to curb enthusiasm. We were just trying to stay away from this chaos we'd had previously where there were X number of different interpretations of it. The other thing we said was um, that we would time box things because while this is, I, I kind of say that threat modeling is very much the, um, the creative side of things, and that's very important. If you reduce threat modeling to just a tool, you've, you've missed the point, okay? This is a lot of wondering about the what ifs, you know, the how, how could get your head out of this is what the system's meant to do, and then go, oh, what might happen? But the problem with that is it can run on and on and on. So we have to time box um, that type of thing uh, as well. So we brought all this together, gave them a bit of um, structure, and things were going well. Okay, but to be honest, none of this is particular to established teams. You have to do that with any team. What happened next, though, was COVID, right? We all, that, that's a shared experience. That was the same for us all. But for us on our threat modeling journey, it, it was painful. It was, the timing was just awful. How dare a global pandemic happen when I was just getting up and running? We didn't really have our training wheels off yet, okay? We were suddenly get, we were getting somewhere, but we weren't, we weren't there. So people went into bubbles, like literal bubbles. Time zones, which we'd always managed, suddenly became a bigger deal. It wasn't just some teams stepped away from the whiteboards and the sticky notes and, and were okay. But what we found was they were generally teams who were a little bit further down the line. And I got a phone call 
from a very important call from a product manager who said to me during whichever lockdown, hey, I want to talk to you about threat modeling. And I was like, sure, great. Yeah, I love talking about threat modeling. But his, his story was a little bit different. He went, so my team, last three threat modeling sessions have produced zero findings. I was like, maybe the software is perfect. Probably not, though. So I did a bit of nosing, basically, and I find out when did these sessions happen, who was involved, etc. We all did a lot of things to make life easier. We changed things um, during COVID. What I found was they were starting to knock the edges off this kind of very, you know, nascent process that we had. And what was actually, what had actually happened on this team was the same person was producing the diagrams or editing the diagrams um, and proposing the threats and proposing the mitigations all in a bubble um, and then passing it async to a colleague to review at some other time. And this had just degenerated into a looks good to me exercise. They had sort of a visual code review thing going on. Nothing was happening. It was all happening by email, etc. So what we realized there was that what we could best do to help, and bearing in mind people were under a lot of stress at that point, was to go back to some facilitated sessions for these teams. Now, the key thing about these facilitated sessions was that they were working sessions. We were there to help. These were not meetings. These were not check-ins. And we had to get over that. We had to, you know, sometimes you have to say things three times. Sometimes you have to say things 30 times and say, we're not here because you are doing a bad job and we're going to make sure you're doing it properly now, okay? We're just here to ask you the right questions. So there was a lot of, again, security having to get back into that hearts and minds things, get people excited again, keep asking, you know, and what else? And what else? And what are you going to do about it? Keep reiterating the four questions. It sounds like, well, hang on, could you not get a bot to do that in the video conference? But that was actually the most value we could bring to it. And we got people running again with this idea of threat modeling. There were a couple of lessons in that for us. And um, we definitely, we have not put it off the table now that we won't go back to facilitated sessions at some point. These reboots of any process are good every now and again. And um, the other thing is, you know, stay friends with product managers. It's helpful that, that, that they, you know, are ready to pick up the phone to you. But the, the key kind of measurable one there for us is watch your outputs. Okay. If the outputs of your thre uh, threat modeling, you're going to have a bulk at the start, you know, when you get going. It's almost like any SAS or DAS tool as well. Oh, here's all your findings, you know. So just because you're doing this as kind of a Gedanken experiment, you'll still come up with a glut of findings at the start. And it's okay for that to tail off or peter away. But if it falls off a cliff or it stays down, yeah, maybe you've perfect software. More likely, you've got an indication of some staleness there. And that's time to kind of kick in and just, you know, get the party started again. One size does not fit all, or Abby actually said to me earlier outside, he goes, one size doesn't fit any. Um, so there were a couple of kind of key observations we spotted along the way. Now, this is by no means exhaustive, but when you're reading, and I'm sure you'll learn lots more about, you know, methods of threat modeling this week as well, but um, it'll tell you to do things certain ways, to set meetings and workshops up certain ways. But you do have to look at the team and you have to look at the context and the culture that, that you're working in. Um, tightly coupled versus loosely coupled applications. So it's a simple one to, to, to go with. Loosely coupled, it's fine for a group of developers working on a feature, maybe their product manager, business analyst, whatever they have, to do the um, threat modeling. That makes sense. That is the bubble. But if you've um, got a tightly coupled large system, maybe an older system, there's no point. So much in threat modeling happens at those, those, those boundary points, the integrations, that if you are too small in your scope, if you, you say, oh, well, we can't have that many people in the room, you're likely to miss all the value. So you need to make a judgment call. 
Okay, you don't want to waste people's time, but it does depend on the system. Okay, decide, you know, if you're doing microservices or something beautifully modularized or whatever, then a small group is probably appropriate. You may have to have a bigger group if you've got a, a tightly coupled system. And um, team geography. This, this does matter. It matters. You shouldn't be married to any tool. Okay. But when teams are uh, dispersed and, you know, you can have fully remote teams, but in the same time zone, that's different to fully remote teams that are like dotted around the world. Once you get this going, teams are inclined to find their own way, their own tools. And um, that could be anything from mirror boards to threat modeling tools. As long as they're getting the output, as long as they're getting the point, um, don't be too hung up on, oh, they're doing it a different way. Okay. And um, tweaking is not cheating. Okay. The same with the, when I say architecture here, what we found was, um, some of our products use uh, leverage the infrastructure they're on very much as, as a, as a feature. Okay. And um, in that case, it was important to have the infrastructure people in the room, in the discussion room, virtual or otherwise. Uh, cloud operations, whatever you call uh, your platform people. In sort of more traditional client server type stuff, that's mostly a waste of their time, okay? And nobody wants to waste time. Everybody has got plenty to do. So it's just all about being a bit flexible. Um, you don't want everybody doing wildly different things, but once they get the idea and get into the groove, we find the best thing to do was to kind of my mom would say, let them off, let them off. You'll find that there's lots of different, I just picked three, but there's, there's lots of different kind of aberrations in, in how people uh, do this. I've just come back from Killarney where the All-Ireland Irish Dancing Championships are going on. And down there, you will see that some of the best dancers in the world are dancing, it still are, it's still going on at, at the moment. They execute so many steps and beats per minute, per second, that you hear the, the phrase muscle memory used a lot. Before they go on to that stage in Killarney, they've done their experimentation over weeks and months and years in the studios. It's too late to be thinking through, do I go left or do I go right or do I point or do I kick or whatever. And Threat modeling's a bit like that. I know you're probably going, have you just drawn a parallel between Irish dancing and threat modeling? Yes, I have. Okay, go with it. Okay. It's just about learning any new skill. Okay. It's, and this is, these are the things we learned. It's sort of starting from the bottom up, but iterate, iterate, iterate. And that was one of the advantages of that, that unattractive group in the middle that we landed on with, with our pilots was they had such quick cycles that they were doing the process um, a little and often. So we were able to tweak. So rather than doing these exhaustive, we have huge systems, um, to do an epic review of I'm trying to find the flaws of 20 years of development and document that and diagram that. Nobody, everybody will lose the will to live by the end of it and you're not going to actually produce anything. They are exhausting and they're mostly fruitless. So a little and often, okay? And set your scope. Again, back to the dancers. They won't try to learn an entire arm pipe in one go for a new competition. If it's going wrong, they won't keep doing the whole exhausting two and a half minute dance again and again and again because there's a bit in the middle that's wrong. They will focus on and say, I am going to work on that movement and I'll do it again and again and again and tweak it. Okay. And that's what you need to do. I will say with any process, but threat modeling, because if you look at the threat modeling manifesto, et cetera, they're not very sp precise steps. You do get to mold it to your environment. And that's how you'll be most successful. But you've got to go through this iteration and improvement. It's, it, it is a whole continuous improvement process with it. Um, and, and the other thing is, is set the scope, set the scope, set the scope. Otherwise, it will just go on for forever. Now, I'm going to apologize to anybody who looked at the description of this talk in advance and went, great, metrics. 
Hope she puts up a bunch of pie charts. I can steal, bring back, throw in a dashboard. There you go. Months work done. That, that's not what's here. Um, again, we ran into challenges. A lot of security runs into this, okay? You're trying to improve the, you're trying to measure the invisible man, okay? Particularly, you know, if you're coming from stable environments where, hey, it's not like we were having a load of security incidents, so what did you stop? You know, trying to prove, trying to measure the thing that didn't happen. So, yeah, reduce security incidents, but if somebody comes back to you, particularly in a hard data-driven environment, and go, well, we had zero incidents for the past 12 months, so you've improved that by going to zero. Great, glad we're spending all this time on, on threat modeling. But there's a lot of side benefits that you can point to as well with threat modeling. One of those is improved documentation, okay? Lots of newer products I know start and get everything, you know, everything in order first, are very compliant oriented, etc. But when you're dealing with older systems, systems that were bright ideas that went to production and then just grew and kept growing and, you know, were used by customers, sometimes you go to a team and there's, there's artifacts that you expect to be there that just aren't, okay? You will not succeed in threat modeling if you just go through that kind of fun exercise of going, hey, we don't have any diagrams or anything like that, anything boring, but we're just going to think about what might go wrong. You might hit on a few things, but you really do need something, a diagram. It doesn't have to be a full DFD, but something back of an envelope will do. So this can force, you know, improved documentation, bringing things up to, up to scratch. The other thing is, um, they say if you want to understand something, teach it. You know, it's kind of the same with this. People will think they understand the system. Should they're plugging away, churning out tickets, you know, in, putting buttons on screens, improving features the whole time. I understand the system. Threat modeling asks some very hard questions, okay? And it's great when you get the diagram up there, and then you should be in kind of an open discussion. But when your colleague goes, but how does that get from there to there? And like, it just it just does, yeah, yeah, automatically. It's like, but, but how, but, when, but where did that, and all these how, where's, when's come out. That's when people have to go back, scratch their head a bit and go, yeah, it's five years since I wrote that. Kind of a different person now. And have a look. And it, it just, it gives an excuse um, and a reason to go back and refresh and to question yourself going, do I really understand what that is doing? And that can bring about all sorts of benefits for a system. It also removes silos. Silos that you may not even be aware have built up on your team, but they, you know, you get into this thing of going, oh, we have a reporting problem. That's Tom. Tom, Tom knows reporting inside out. That's Grant. Oh, there's, there's something wrong on the accounts payable screen, blah, 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 blah. Um, that, that's over to Anne. That's Anne's problem. That's, now, the problem is when you go to then threat model is all about these interactions. Anne and Tom suddenly need to, you know, my bit's working fine, my bit's fully secure, but when they talk to each other, what's going on? And you can break down those silos, and that gives a load of kind of knowledge sharing benefits, et cetera, that are just healthy for the product. So these are ways that I have kind of illustrated the benefits of threat modeling that aren't the core benefits. They're not really the reason you go out to, to do it. They're the kind of bonus items. They can be easier to point to if you have, you know, if you're trying to get buy-in, trying to get approval to keep, you know, using time to do this, um, and you're pointing to an improvement of zero incidents to zero incidents. I'll give a little caution about the, the other thing you could measure is the number of tickets produced by threat modeling. That can get skewed very quickly. Um, particularly if you're dealing with a large organization. One team is going, we found 60 tickets, therefore, yay, we're great. And another team has found two. Oh, they're terrible. They need to try harder. They found two things that are legit and something we could do something about. These are talking about muscle uh, missiles coming from Mars, you know, and it's all just, it's going in and being automatically closed and all the rest. And they're just, they're just spewing stuff into JIRA or, or your ticketing platform of choice. Others are available. Um, so you have to kind of watch for, for that type of thing. It's, it's an easy metric to kind of put up on a bowler or a pie chart and, you know, go to some exact summary, but it can be a dangerous one because it, it, it can influence behaviors in the wrong way.
so the, the issue with the conclusions of this talk is it's not like, there's no mathematical formulas, it's not deeply technical. It kind of seems a bit obvious, right? I wish it had been obvious when I started trying to implement this across a lot of developers. Um, I'm blessed that I didn't get fired with so many failures along the way, but these are the really simple, it's, it's like the solution to anything, you know, whether it's a Sudoku or whatever, when you get to the end of it, go, oh, that was obvious, but it wasn't. So the first one is to set the scope, okay? You can, particularly for established teams, you've got huge systems with lots of different parts to it. Yes, you will miss something by not doing the whole system but you're probably gonna be more effective, you know, weigh it up and say, let's just focus on, what we do is you, you, you threat model what you're working on. So whatever feature you're doing, just threat model that. That actually builds up very, very quickly and you get something that is approaching a threat model of your entire system. And um, whether that's your goal or not, but the, it's that little and often set the scope, then you're moving on to another feature, set the scope, and it's like a jigsaw, you put all the pieces together. And that brings you on to a little and often. That was key. I will never change from that strategy. Somebody's going to come back to me and say, oh, you did change. But I, I don't see us changing from that strategy. That has been something that came out that was successful. Um, just take that little bit. Don't try to boil the ocean. And you can keep changing. You can see the problems with it. You know, as I said, we had teams who decided that uh, absolutely have to have the diagram before the session. Um, otherwise, it's pointless. Uh, other teams came back and went, no, when he, she comes into the, the room with the diagram, nobody's following it. He's already three steps ahead of us and it's, it, it doesn't work either. So there's lots of little tweaks you can make along the way and um, how you, how you go about it, whether you want documentation, whether it's all going to be free flowing. But if you do this only like once a year or once, even once a quarter or once a major release, it's so long since you've done it that you don't remember the things that you were going, oh, that didn't work the last time, okay? And you end up doing the same broken process the whole time, so a little and often. Uh, time box the activity. I mean the entire, act everything needs to be time boxed because of the creative uh, elements of, of threat modeling, it can go on and on. So within, wherever you choose to put it within your, your, your development life cycle, within your sprints or whatever, do just limit it and say, this is the amount of time we're going to give to it. Now you can tweak that again as you go along and say, well, that's too short, that's too long. But give it, you know, say we're going to do 90 minutes at the start of a major feature or, you know, 30 minutes a week or something like that. If you leave it open-ended, you will start to see calendar invites popping in for every second day and you're like going, everybody's threat modeling and nobody's actually producing any software. Within your threat modeling sessions, Take that theme again, uh, time box each activity, because what otherwise you will find is everybody, it's very quickly get through the first question of, you know, what are we doing? The what can go wrong depends basically on people's moods, where they are, you know? If they're feeling super creative, you will end up talking about those missiles coming in from Mars, and suddenly a five minute warning, and you've not really gotten anywhere, okay? You've, you've had a great time, but you've not produced anything. There isn't a single ticket, there's nothing to work on, okay? The next step would be to say, and get somebody, it can be your scrum master, it can be the product manager, it can be the most junior dev on the team who gets empowered to say, right, you're gonna call it when we've done enough, do an Elmo on it, you know, let's, let's move on. We've, we've found enough threats for the moment, we'll be back here in, a week, a month, whatever, next next ticket, and we can find more. But let's stop now, we found them. Move on to the, the solutions, what are we going to do about it? You need to time box that as well, because otherwise people will get right into a whole solutioning session, and sounds nice, but like the code will nearly be written before you leave the, the, the door, and you'll get one done, or something like that. And it's also, ideas are great to share, but it's maybe not the place for doing that. The other thing is um, meet development teams where they're at, okay? It was really, um, where I work, you know, standardization is key because it scales. Um, but even within that, the teams are in different places. So 
you know, like I said, when we had COVID, some teams ha had taken their training wheels on, off and were, were good to keep going. They just needed a little bit of a rub on the back, keep going, it's all good, you've got this. Other teams it just need to recognize and say, you need a little bit more help. Um, again, we have some very globally dispersed teams they can't, it's, it's not a good idea to be getting people up at 3 a.m. to do threat modeling just because you want them all on the same thing, you know. So work with them on tools and things that will work for them. And um, you want development teams to own and value this. You don't want this to be another thing that came down from the waggy finger brigade up in security saying, now you've got to do this as well. And they're kind of going, this isn't what I signed up for. So meet them where they're at, where you have those really refined teams, really structured, flying through the process. That, that, that team that had already been doing threat modeling, I changed nothing about what they did in the end. I just walked away and said, you know, you've got this. This is fine. This works for you. And um, you, you do it. But they're actually doing a very tight, formal version of threat modeling. They've done it so often, though, that it's not disruptive. It's really helpful. They don't spend too much time on it. Uh, and the other, the, the real key one, the, the hero of that story was um, the product manager who, who picked up the phone and said, there's no output coming. Now, did he want me to turn around and say, okay, cancel it? Maybe. I don't know. I didn't entertain the, the, the possibility at the time. But we, we, we really learned something key there that um, probably... Uh, COVID put a, a bit of a magnifying glass on it. People will always cut the edges off systems and processes, but the, the lack of output was was really telling us there. That was a really good indicator. Feel free to go spy in JIRA if you don't want to go asking people. Um, set up a little filter for yourself, see how, what the output is, um, but a lack of output can just mean that the, 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 the process is dying. And that's okay. As I said, we've signed up to this thing of every now and again, we may need to relaunch, reboot, re-inject a bit of energy into it because it's certainly worthwhile in terms of benefits. So I suppose that the bottom line is the bottom line on the slide. Um, established teams can successfully adopt threat modeling. You know, there's, there's lots of side discussions that I'm sure will, will happen out in the hallway. One is about, you know, automation versus not automation you know, tooling, uh, those type of things. And, and people can get really um, fanatical about those discussions. And um, does threat modeling sit with Agile? I'll, you know, but th that's another one that can get quite heated. But the one that, you know, we experienced and it would have been, I suppose we came close to thinking this isn't doable for established teams. We're too far down the line that the ship has sailed you can and you can get huge benefits from introducing threat modeling on established teams. Old dogs can learn new tricks. So if anybody has any questions, I'll be very honest and say I don't know if I don't know. Um, I'll start with yes for the last question. Do we allow different cadence for different teams? This is back to the point of um, meet the, the teams where they're at. Um, I'm going to borrow from Kim earlier and say it depends. Um, so we have some, we have teams that are, are, are working on kind of innovation. You know, they're very much at, at the early stages of things. They would be inclined to work on sort of large projects. Not, in some cases, nothing's gone to production yet anyway. So they're, they're working on big ideas. They do it sort of once for that. They always keep an eye on it. We've gotten a good culture of keeping an eye on your threat model as you go. Um, but we've kind of let them say there's, there's no point in them doing it like ticket by ticket or anything like that. And um, with the other, with sort of the mature teams that are in that middle ground, they do it by, they do it by feature, okay? Slight caveat on it. We have a bar below. If it's, if it's a ticket and it's, it is a feature, but it's, it's really simple. All we ask them to do is, can you have a little thought and go, does the diagram or documentation need to be updated? But we are leaving it to their integrity to do that properly. And 
kind of leaving it to their integrity. They'll call each other out though if it's like the next person to pick up that piece go, this was never updated for your thing. So it's kind of, there's a bit of self-policing goes on there. Um, but they're all in kind of rapid development life cycles. So it, it is quite often, it's generally feature based, but that's how we reduce the scope as well. So we're not doing it. Some teams would bring a, you know, a sprint of, if, if a sprint of tickets are, when you put them all together, they really are all working in one area. There's a whole new theme to the feature. They may have a bigger threat modeling session to look at those interactions. Um, but, but teams who've gotten off the ground, have good diagrams, et cetera, are doing it feature by feature. Um, and to, to answer your question about policy, we have some catch-all wording that says kind of as appropriate and agreed to your team. Be careful how I answer this. <laughs> um, it was it was feedback. We had to broker some conversations because Anne and John didn't necessarily really want to talk to each other either. Okay, that just happens. It's it's human nature. Okay, and we the, I suppose we spotted it first before we we measured it and realised it was a benefit. And um, we were talking to Anne about what her findings were. Um, and she was kind of saying, we'd say, oh, and what about this? And what about this? And she'd go, that's, that's Bob. That's, that's Bob's problem. And we're kind of going, mm, but it's not. So then we kind of talked to Bob. So this is back to the hearts and minds. We had to bring people together. And then we started to hear from engineering managers and product managers going, oh, it's great. The, the two of them are now working on things. And now it turns out they've actually completely unrelated to security. They're changing some feature because she didn't realize what his, piece of the, the system was actually doing or how it was intaking or some additional functionality. Oh, I didn't realize you'd be able to handle that. I can now push that data into you and you can deliver some extra feature. So it kind of came about organically and um, it was more an observation than we definitely didn't go out going, hey, threat modeling is going to do this, this and this and it's going to break down silos. We started doing threat modeling and then we started going, ah, this is breaking down silos. Some silos are very obvious, you know, when, when you know, Alice and Bob don't talk to each other type of thing. Others you don't read, they're there and two people can be, you know, work together all the time and don't realize that they've become so reliant on each other to look after a certain area. It's like, you so got this. I don't need to know that um, they forget that Bob might walk under a bus someday, you, you know, and, and that they don't really understand what's going on because he's so good or she's so good at what they do it's never a problem. You don't realize you're not understanding it. So yeah, again, sorry, no pie charts or graphs or bowlers for measuring that. It's just how it went. Yes? Oh, it definitely started as, as a burden. I was, I did cash in kind of chips from previous successful things. Um, I will give credit to the senior engineering leadership. They sort of went, okay. Um, but that's kind of the lessons I'm trying to say. Make sure that you're kind of armed with these things as benefits and that and say, look, it will definitely do these things and I think it will bring, you know, it'll give better security awareness and we'll start to catch things in advance. Um, you know, feel, point out to other organizations, if you're trying to get that executive leadership and you're really starting from scratch, point to other organizations that have done it, but try and find organizations that are a bit like yours. If you're, you know, a, a 30, 40, 50 year old company and, you know, the software is 25 years plus, don't point to a startup, you know, because they're just, they're, they're smart people. They're just going to go, but that's not us, you know. So try and find similarities. There's plenty now in the community who've done it in established teams. Um, and with the actual down at the engineering level and that, just the scope thing. Don't overwhelm them and say, hey, I know you only got here two years ago, but I want you to threat model 25 years of design into it. So just like tell them to breathe and set the scope. I think Uh, 
Yeah, it's the same, it's the same thing as, you know, when people come in and even with Chul and go, oh, that's a false positive. And you kind of go, is it a false positive? And then you get, you dig in a bit deeper and they go, well, it'll never happen. And like, that's a different thing. Um, and you know, you have to just, this is where I think you don't need a security unicorn in every group. Okay. And, um, but they can't be afraid. You need to have systems like where they, if it's too big, too much work, if it's going to derail you now, can go in the backlog. Okay. Just we'll, we'll, we'll manage it and that they're supported in managing that. Do the threat modeling. I, I think, and I'll leave, I know we're at time, but I, I make a comment. It's actually, there's a lot of parallels between that and um, Q8 testing. You, you know what I mean? It, it's the same idea. You need to be kind of involved in getting it done. You can have, you can hand it off. That was the old model. You finished code, compile, build, throw it off to somebody you never saw it again. But what have we seen? It's been much better to just integrate everybody into the process. Same with threat modeling. Yeah. That's Thank it. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.